Hello students, it's Mr. Ross. I uh, am wearing a hat because I didn't do my hair and um, quite frankly this is a pretty sweet hat. So um, we're going to talk about one of my favorite topics today which is fossils. Why do I like fossils? Because I'm a science nerd. Duh. Okay, you guys have seen my class. I've got rocks sitting everywhere. I've got fossils in the cupboards. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm just a little kid. I love going into the creek and finding things like this. Okay. Yeah, this was found in my creek in my backyard. And like this fossil. Let's see that. Yeah. And this one I've already told you guys a bunch of times. I found in Sycamore Creek. But like there's a bunch of little fossils in here. And there's a little fossil right there. I just like going fossil hunting. I don't care what I find. So um, the reason that we need to care about fossils in our science class is because actually fossils can be used to do something called biostratigraphy, which is going to be at the end of this set of notes. Um, biostratigraphy is really where we take like rocks that have fossils. We look at what fossils they have. And because we've taken tons of data around the world, some fossils, if we find them, we know from a specific time period where they were alive and when they were alive. And so we can say, if this rock layer has that fossil in it, that rock layer must be somewhere between that old, okay? So if there's like a species that only lived from 150 to 160 million years ago, if we find that in a rock layer, we know that rock layer is 150 to 160 million years old. That's pretty cool, okay? Um, so when we take a look at fossils though, the first thing I want us to be aware of is just kind of, what is a fossil? How does it form? Um, we, you know, it, I did something a couple years ago where I held up a bunch of rocks around the room just to ask students, is this a fossil? And like, a lot of people didn't know. So let's take a look at what a fossil is. What's a fossil? It's a rock. Sorry. That's it. Psych. All right, come on. Um, fossils are the preserved remains or traces of organisms. And they're usually preserved in rock. There are some people who say it has to be preserved in rock. There are other people who say doesn't have to necessarily be in rock. As long as it's preserved from a really long time ago in the geologic record, it's pretty much a fossil, okay? So they are oftentimes in rock form, but it doesn't necessarily have to be in rock form. We'll get to that. So um, fossil is just the preserved remains or traces of an organism, something that was living, now preserved in the rock record. All right, this is the next part though. Fossils are not really that easy to form. Like if you guys have ever driven down the road and you look outside and you see like a dead something on the side of the road, that dead something, if you drive by it every day for like a couple weeks, you'll notice it starts to decompose. And if that happens, it will not become a fossil. So there are some specific things that have to happen. Um, fossils form under very strict conditions. They form best when, number one, they have some kind of hard body parts, whether it's, you know, wood okay wood is a hard part of a plant whereas like a little flower they're not easy to fossilize um, if it has like teeth bones shells those are hard body parts um, they get preserved best when they die whole so like if something comes along and eats part of it and rips it up that's really exposing it to a lot of decay and it probably won't fossilize anyways so it has to die whole doesn't always have to but it just gets preserved best when that happens when everything is kind of intact um, when they get covered up quickly after dying, again, this is kind of rare, okay? How often does something die on the side of the road and then it gets covered by a ton of like sand or something? That's not very often, so it um, has to get covered very quickly after death. And that actually leads into the very last thing. They form best when there's very little oxygen around them. Why? Because oxygen decomposes stuff or it helps decompose stuff. So if all four of these things happen, you might get a fossil. So think about how rare that stuff is happening in nature in a very short amount of time. Like jellyfish, they don't have hard body parts, so they probably don't fossilize. Um, there's a lot of things that when they die, something comes and eats it, so it won't die whole. There's a lot of things that like when they die, they die out in the middle of nowhere where it ain't going to get covered up. So yeah, that's going to take care of three and four. And there are some things that die in high oxygen environments, like where we live, okay? Um, if you die in like a swamp, sometimes if you sink to the bottom of the water, that's a little bit lower oxygen and you might be okay there and fossilized. But yeah, um, most things on earth do not become fossils. In fact, that takes us to our next point. The fossil record is actually very biased. 
and it's biased in favor of things that live in water. So aquatic fossils, they form very easily because in the water there's all these sediments all mixed around and you have the sediments raining down on things all the time. So if you look at this fish right here, it died. If it sank to the bottom, then it gets covered by sand and stuff that's floating around in the water and just kind of deposits on top of it. And eventually it can form a fossil. If a different fish like doesn't sink to the bottom and it just goes to the surface of the water because it went belly up, other fish come and eat it, it breaks apart, doesn't become a fossil. So aquatic fossils form really easily. And when you look at terrestrial fossils, oops, pardon me, it's a little harder to form a terrestrial fossil, a fossil for something that lives on land because they have to get covered really quickly and that only happens in like landslides, when there's a big flood that deposits tons of mud, sometimes in volcanic eruptions like you guys may have read about in Pompeii in seventh grade um, world history. If something freezes in ice and gets covered in snow and all that, it could fossilize. And it's usually some kind of catastrophic event. So aquatic fossils form pretty regularly because the conditions are just right with all those sediments just falling on top of them. Terrestrial fossils, it's a little bit more dicey. So um, to become a fossil, it's actually easier if you are an aquatic organism, if you lived in the water. So here are some example questions. You just answer these on your own and I'll give you the answer in a second. Which of these would be the best location for a fossil to form? In the bottom of a swamp or a fast moving river? Windy desert or a grassland? Bottom of the ocean or the middle of a rainforest? All right, pause the video, try to answer those and then I'll answer them. Okay. Um, in the bottom of a swamp is going to be better. Here's why. Swamps don't have lots of oxygen in them and they're not moving around tons to like break up the carcass. So bottom of a swamp is the best place to fossilize on the first example. Then when you take a look at the desert one and the grassland, that one's kind of hard. I would go with desert because there's tons of sediments that can blow over top of something and cover it up. Okay. Um, so that one's a little bit more difficult. The last one, this should be a little bit more easy because we just talked about it. Go with the bottom of the ocean. Absolutely. Middle of the rainforest, not as good because it's not as easy to get covered up in the middle of a rainforest. Okay. All right, so there we go. I have the answers right there and you can take a look at them. <clears throat> now, here are some examples of things that might get fossilized. Which organisms are more likely to be fossilized? A beetle or a slug? A bird or a fish? Tree or moss? Whoops, hold on one second, guys. All right, go back to this. Um, a jellyfish or a crab? Again, try and answer, and I'll show you the answers in a second. Just pause them, try and answer. Okay. Um, the answer is a beetle is going to be easier to fossilize because it has hard body parts, while a jellyfish does not. The next one is a fish. And the fish is because it's more likely to get covered and in the water there's less oxygen to decompose it. Um, tree is easier to fossilize than moss because the tree has hard body parts. That would be the wood. Moss does not have hard parts. And then the last one, a crab. Again, the crab has hard body parts. Let's go back and look. The crab or the jellyfish. Yeah. Um, and I misspoke earlier. It was a beetle versus a slug. Beetle fossilizes again because of hard body parts. So what's the point of all this information I'm giving you about fossils? First of all, like I said, most things don't become fossils. And then the fossil record is biased, not only because there's a lot of things that can't fossilize like soft bodied things, but aquatic organisms are far more likely to become fossils. So now that we know a little bit about what kind of things will fossilize, what are the types of fossils we have? Now, you do not have to memorize these types of fossils. It's more just for people who are interested, okay? So the first two types that are most common are going to be casts and molds. So when something has a hard body part and it gets trapped in sediment, it makes like an impression into the sand. That impression is a mold. Now, if the body part like dissolves and then the space that it leaves fills up with other stuff, then it makes like a 3D imprint in, or sorry, a 3D kind of filling, and that 3D filling is what we call the cast. Molds and casts are very common. Um, a couple examples that you guys might want to take a look at, like this one right here. This is like the 3D filled out portion, so this is actually a cast. 
Um, this one that I showed you guys earlier, it's like the end or sorry, edge of a shell. This one is an imprint into the sediment. And so this one is a mold. Okay. Again, the mold is like the imprint. The cast is like the 3d filling. Okay. These types of things are very, very common. Um, most of the time, if you pick up a fossil, that's pretty much what you're probably looking at. So. Um, the next type is a permineralization, and these ones are not as common, they're a little bit more common, um, but what happens is if something gets completely covered really quickly and very little decay happens, then a lot of that stuff actually gets preserved, and water can kind of seep into its um, body parts, even into its cells, and that water deposits all sorts of minerals that take on the shape of everything inside the cell. You can actually even find fossils that have like their cells preserved. You can look at the shape of their cells and everything. These are very, very detailed and they can even happen with things that are very soft bodied like uh, jellyfish and things like that. So they're pretty cool. Um, the next one is a carbon film. Carbon film also can happen with soft bodied creatures. When something gets like pressed down in between sediments, um, essentially what happens is over time heat and pressure will cause the carbon that's inside of the living thing and all living things have carbon it'll cause it to imprint on the rock layer and give like a shadow of the organism it is essentially like a pencil drawing of what the creature looked like um, when you guys do your lab for me i have a couple of uh, fern fossils most of those fern fossils are carbon films so um, these ones can also be very detailed just like the permineralizations that we just looked at you have like a flower down here. You can even see the veins in the flower. This is a leaf right here. And then this is something I believe that's called, I think it's a graptolite, if I remember correctly. Look that up. And then another type. This is a special one. It's called amber. You guys have probably seen this with like Jurassic Park and stuff like that. Um, tree sap in a tree. If you know a tree gets damaged, it comes out of the tree. So all this tree sap is oozing out. And it can pretty much like dry out and become a fossil in and of itself. So amber is a fossil by itself. But sometimes other things get caught in the amber. That could be like bugs, fungi, bacteria. If you look at this one down here, this fuzzy stuff is a bunch of um, fungi right here. This is the head of a lizard. There's its leg. And then when this thing goes down here, this is its tail. And then here's this little spider over here. So the organisms can get preserved in this. And this is actually then a case where you have two fossils in one. The amber is a fossil, and then the thing inside of it is a fossil. Um, there are some people who don't consider these fossils, though, because it's not technically a rock. But for all our purposes, yeah, it's pretty much a fossil. So um, one really cool one to make note of, I think it was a couple years back in, like, maybe 2015. Um, there were some scientists who were down in Southeast Asia, and they went to a local market where they knew they were selling, like, amber that was like fossil amber and they actually found one that had a dinosaur tail in it and that tail had feathers on it so that's just more proof that shows that uh dinosaurs are the uh i guess the ancestors of modern day birds so um amber can hold a lot of really cool stuff in there and the last type of fossil that you might talk about is what we call a trace fossil these are also known as ichno fossils, which I didn't write on here, but um, I C H N O fossils. Okay, these are actually just the leftover evidence of organisms, but they're not actually part of the organism. So, like tracks, the ones on the far left, those are theropod dinosaur tracks, like a T Rex tracks. Um, the ones in the middle are feeding tracks. There were like some kind of animal that lived on the ocean floor was kind of going back and forth in a pattern and trying to figure out where there was food. Um, the ones in the bottom left, or sorry, bottom right hand corner, those are actually underground burrows that got preserved. Um, sometimes you'll hear about like dinosaurs that have eaten stones to kind of grind up food in their tummies. Those are called gastroliths. And um, those are a lot of times very rounded stones. And those are an example of a trace fossil. And the last one, which is the one in kind of the right side in like a salmon background, that's called a coprolite. Take a guess what that is. If you know anything about scatology, that is poop. So yes, poop is a trace fossil. Um, the important thing about trace fossils is that they tell us about the behavior of organisms. So each of these things tells us behavior of organisms, not something you can tell if you just had the skeleton of it. Okay. 
So again, why do we care about fossils? Well, um, fossils actually help us date events. There are certain fossils that we call index fossils or guide fossils, and they can tell us when rock layers formed. These fossils are very special. Um, the reason they're special is because the organisms that are in them, we know they lived a certain amount of time and they only existed for a certain amount of time. If we find an organism in that rock layer, we know that that rock layer formed in a certain period. So if you look at like the fossil on the far right at the bottom, um, all three of these fossils, by the way, are called trilobites, but they're different trilobites. They all lived at different times. If that fossil on the far right bottom lived like 460 to 480 million years ago, and I find it, I know that rock layer is 460 to 480 million years old. It's pretty straightforward, okay? Um, to be a good index fossil, you have to have three characteristics. First of all, you have to be easily identified, and one thing I would add to that is you're easily identified even if we don't find your whole body. So there are some things that you guys will look at, like crinoids, and they look like little stacks of um, lifesavers for, their, for part of their body, and those lifesaver stacks are very specific to each species, and so we can figure out, like, what kind of crinoid was this? When did it live? Um, you guys know there's, like, tons of different types of starfish and tons of different types of beetles and tons of different types of, you know, whatever it is. So if you can identify pretty much what kind one thing is just from a couple of body parts, then it's a good index fossil. Now, it also has to have only existed for a very short period of time. If something has been alive for like 2 billion years, it's not going to help us narrow down any rock layers. So it either has to have gone extinct in a relatively short amount of time, or it has to have changed its features through natural selection and evolution um, in some amount of time. So it has to be easily identified. It has to exist for a shorter period of time, geologically speaking. And then the other one is it has to be found in a wide variety of areas. This is because we have to like look at rock layers all around the world with these things. So if it's something that only lived in like this tiny little lagoon one time in history, it's not going to be helpful. It has to be widespread, widespread geographically, exist for a very short period of time, and easily identified. Okay. So here are some examples. Trilobites and ammonites are very, very good ones. When you look at the ammonites, um, you can see that their shells, and like they have these little divisions in them, and those division shapes change. At first, on the left, they're very, very curved, like nice moon shape almost. Um, the next one over, it's kind of like a wavy line, and then it gets a little bit more zebra stripey, and then on the far right, it almost looks like crystal patterns. Um, this is kind of the evolution of this group, the ammonites, and so if I find a shell fragment that has one of these patterns in there, I can tell it's from a certain period in time. So that's very helpful to us. Um, when you look at trilobites, trilobites are super diverse. There's a lot of different variety, and each one of them lived at a specific period of time. Um, these things were like the dominant predators, or, well, not top predators, but they were very dominant species within the oceans before dinosaurs were around. So um, we can use those very easily. So index fossils and biostratigraphy. Biostratigraphy is when we use the fossil record to help us date the rock layers. Um, we can also help determine rock layers, you know, if they're the same age based on do they have the same fossils in them. If they have the same fossils as one another, they are probably the same age or very near the same age. Okay, so when we take a look here, you have four rock, square, or, uh, rock outcrops. They have a bunch of different fossils in them. Um, which rock layers are the same age? Well, when we take a look, we actually have to figure out which of the fossils is a good index fossil. So index fossils have to be widespread. They have to be found like everywhere. Okay, so, well, this one's not found anywhere except in this rock outcrop, so that's a bad one. Let's get rid of that. Don't think about that one anymore. Um, they have to have existed for a short period of time geologically speaking speaking so that really means like did it show up in every layer because if it did it's not very short-lived so this one showed up just here just here but look over here it showed up in like all the layers so it was around for a long time so this one not a good fossil we're not going to look at it over here here or here either um same with this one this one was very recent and very distant past so we're not going to look at that and same thing over here. So we're not going to look at these little trilobite fossils 
These are called brachiopods. We're not going to look at those. I'm not going to look at this one, which I think is a crinoid. And then the last thing is it has to be easily identified. Can you tell it apart from the other stuff? I want to say, yeah, I can tell this is different. So the one that is a good index fossil is this one. So everything that has this index fossil in it is formed about the same time. So this layer is the same age as this layer, and it's the same age as this layer, and it's the same age as this layer. Everything above those is younger than this layer. Everything below those is older than this layer. So this is getting back into some of our relative dating laws, okay? So these ones, although we can't necessarily correlate them yet, if we found more fossils, we might be able to say like, maybe this one was actually the same age as this one, and this one was just like not the same as any of them. It was just kind of an in-between layer. Um, you guys will have real examples of that in the lab that we do a little bit later, okay? <clears throat> so here's another example. Which of these is a good index fossil? When we take a look at it, um, you have to find something that was short-lived, something that you know is found in all areas, and something that is uh, very easily identified. So all these things look different from each other. That's not a problem. But the one that I can see where it's in all places, and it's not there for like long periods of time, like it's not at the top, the middle, and the bottom, is this trilobite right here. So this layer is the same age as this layer. And then that means these two layers are the same as, hopefully found it over here, layer A, okay? So this layer is the same as this, age-wise, that is. And then this one is the same age as this one, okay? We're gonna do some more examples of biostratigraphy a little bit later in the course. Um, we will actually be doing that with this fossils lab that I will tell you about here in just a little bit. So. Um, you guys make sure you get all these notes. If you need to go back, redo some stuff, feel free to do that. And we will talk to you soon.